This episode is about editing real estate photos. I want to show some of the techniques that are used, the methods that are used, but I also want to first dispel this common myth that it just takes too long to edit real estate photos and that you should be outsourcing your photos. It's very difficult to do unless you outsource this, but that's just not true. The fact is, if you learn how to edit your own photos, if you do your own photo editing and you practice enough at it, then you're going to be a better photographer overall and you're actually going to be able to expand your photography business. Because editing doesn't really take that long for most real estate photography gigs. And by expanding your editing capability, also you'll be able to get other types of gigs. But the biggest thing overall is that if you are outsourcing your editing, you feel you need to outsource your editing, then you're going to diminish your quality as a photographer. You won't become a better photographer over time. And the biggest reason that may be obvious is that you're only going to be doing half the work. Now, while that may be enticing from a work day, what that means is you are just a shutter release. So if you're out there capturing footage, then any bad footage could be massaged by a good editor. You'd never know if your footage is actually good or bad. But moreover than that is as you learn to edit, you'll know on site how to handle things better and more quickly so that you can also then reduce your time editing and know how to capture the proper footage. And this goes for any genre of photography, real estate photography included. Now, nobody wants their skills to atrophy. We don't want to become worse photographers. We want to become better photographers. But unfortunately, this myth has been propagated so much throughout social media by a lot of photographers that will share photos that they've had edited and they'll sing the praises of their editor. But the fact is, is that if you're singing the praises of an editor, that means that you couldn't edit as well as that editor could. Now, great job for the editor that did this, but you're not really doing the work. You're out there just being a shutter release, you're just capturing footage. Because here's something that's really often overlooked. So one of the edges that I have over other real estate photographers in my market is twofold just from the fact that I edit my own photos. One, I can, if somebody wants photos the same day, I can charge a premium and deliver them the same day. I don't have to wait for the editor to have the results the next day and hope that they're all correct because if the client wants any other additions or they want any other changes, they might have to wait yet another day because of the time zone differences that you have. But the second thing, and this is really often overlooked, is that some of this myopic short-term view that I'm doing listing market photos, so this is just run of the mill, I just need to have this outsourced so I can run around to a whole bunch of houses. Once you step up your game and you really become better at real estate photography and you really up your game in editing, you're going to be able to take on gigs by remodel companies, by builders, designers, stages, architects, other commercial type of work. And a year later, two years later, three months down the road, they might come back and go, you know what we want to do? We want to change these uh, chair colors. We're not really hip on the red anymore. We'd like to change that to try to match the cabinet colors. You know, these orange chairs aren't really working so well in this kitchen. Let's change those to match the backsplash more to a blue. Let's remove some items out of here. Let's do some virtual staging so we can put some better furniture in here or so that we can even put items on shelves. Small little changes may come in later and these are things you charge by the hour for. If all you're doing is thinking about how you're going to be editing and justifying not doing your own editing because you're shooting real estate listings, you're not going to have a sustainable career. So if you really want to have growth, like in any career, you typically want to grow. If you do want to grow as a real estate photographer, then you want to be able to get toward that glass ceiling. You want to be able to do architectural work. You will want to be able to do other type of work besides just running around to real estate listings. So if you want to become a good photographer, you need to be a good editor. So anyways, with all that said, I'd like to now step through the techniques, some of the methods, so we get a bigger picture once again. If you might be already familiar with some of this, I think it would serve as a good recap so that you can once again see where the different markets lie for the various editing techniques that you might want to approach. 
So there are two main types of real estate photo editing that depends on how the photos were taken, HDR and Flambient. Now, you might be familiar with both of these, but how they're used today is really somewhat different than what you may think from years past, especially HDR has changed quite a bit and Flambient has been refined over time as well. Now, I cover both techniques in detail in my online course on expert editing. This has over 30 video lessons. It shows how to do Flambient and HDR editing and a slew of techniques for just about anything you'll employ encounter with editing while you're working with interiors and that is the toughest nut to crack because we're up against a lot of different stuff going on inside of a house. So first though, let's start talking about my preferred method, Flambient, that gets high-end results. And first, let's start with a very simple example. So in this case, this is a very simple example where this is the finished image here in Lightroom. We can see not bad looking image, pretty good looking. This was flambient. And to capture this with getting that clear view to the outside, getting all the correct colors, we started with typical flambient if you're familiar with it. If not, it's taking a ambient shot and then taking a flash shot and blending those together with a certain technique that I'll show in just a second. And then also doing a window pull and a window pull repair layer. And doing a window pull, we'll be able to not worry about cutting in these windows. Something a little different when we get to HDR. But I'm gonna expand on this flambient also to really take this to the next level. But first, let's go back over here into Photoshop with what it took to make this finished image. Now, the time on site, once you're used to using flash, because there is a flash layer involved here, it does go very quickly. But the thing is, the editing itself goes very quickly because there's less work to try to get things done right. Let's take a look why. At the very bottom of our layer stack, this was a flash shot that was taken. And this particular one, just for this simple kitchen, I was just holding a speed light above my head. Now doing that with the proper exposure means that I'm gonna be getting rid of all the color problems. Cause up above that, that's our ambient shot. Now you look, that doesn't look like an ambient shot. And the reason being is let's shut off this layer mask for a second take this layer and put it back to where it was. It started out in normal blending mode. So this is typically how you would have seen that ambient shot when you took it. But in the flambient technique, what we're doing is we change that into luminosity blending mode, and then we add a layer mask that then controls how much of that luminance is shown. And typically that's right at about 50% of the opacity. Also then with that layer mask, I can control other areas that I might wanna remove or add luminance to. I can duplicate this layer if I want to and add even more on top of it. So immediately we get correct colors because we were using flash and then we can add as much natural luminance, natural light, not color, to our image by using the flambient technique. It's very quick, very simple using actions in Photoshop. Next up, is a very simple window pulse that we can get these views to the outside and not have to worry about, for instance, trying to cut out this window around this faucet. What this was, this was a shot that if we take a look at it as it was originally shot, was just an overexposed image with the flash pointed at the window. So when we take this and we turn that into darken mode, then we can see the view to the outside. And then we just mask in the window and that's just a matter of just drawing. You can see here a sloppy polygon around here. You don't have to try to cut in the windows. So you don't have to, to worry about that. And then just a little added touch to get rid of some of the reflections. You take a shot without any flash. And then here, this was just desaturating the ceiling, a very simple action to do that. Well, once that's done, it's saved. Then it's just brought over into Lightroom back where it was you do a few minor adjustments with a post-processing preset like I show in the courses, I show also in my books, and you're done. That's it, you move on to the next image and you have this high quality image. Now, let's take this though to the next level. So this is a great example of why sometimes flash works a lot better. So this is a finished image we can see here, pretty good, looks pretty like even lighting, but it still looks natural. 
Now, if we take a look though at the footage that was involved, let's go over here to where the flambient shot was taken. So this is, excuse me, the ambient shot. So this was the ambient shot taken before I started doing flashes. So the ambient shot, you can see by nature, this would be very difficult to work with no matter how many ambient layers you tried to work together because as we go over here, we've got really big blown out areas. And then we've got some neutral areas in here. And of course, colors are all over the place. And white balance, no matter what you do, is not gonna correct that. But as soon as you start introducing flash, you can see the colors go away. Now, this was unique in that it would take other flash layers to help. So for instance, in this case, besides that flash, I was doing what's known as compositing, where I'm flashing both sides, and then also I'm using an interesting technique here of where I can use a light and blending mode, I'll show that in Photoshop, where I can then fill in these other areas. So let's take a look at this in Photoshop. Now, granted, this is a more complex example and it will take longer to not only shoot to capture that footage, but it will take longer to edit than if you had tried to do HDR, which once again, I'm gonna to get to HDR in just a second and show you how to do high-end HDR. But with this, you get a very high quality image and it all started with taking a flash shot and then doing some composites. And each one of these is just me on the other side using the proper blending mode that I'm also gonna use here and look at the hallway. I'm easily able to light up the hallway only and then also the upstairs only by doing these other flash shots and using the proper blending modes for each one. Now, once I add that ambient luminance here, like we did before, this was just added selectively just in a few places to bring out a little bit of the natural light. Then all I did was desaturate the ceiling a little bit. And then up here, I grouped this together because I wanted to then add some fire over here. So that's what I did. So this was uh, just a fireplace addition here where I added in, there's the flame layer, some other colors, things that I show how to do in the editing course, also show how to do in my advanced editing book. But uh, this right here, yes, it did take more work. But this is the type of work that will get you higher paying gigs. So the rest of the house didn't need this much work for this particular real estate listing. The other angles weren't that difficult, but this one had a lot of light disparity, which we can see from the ambient shot. This would be very difficult to work with. So this is a case where Flambient can really excel once you learn how to use flash and editing properly. But let's take this even a step further. So this is a great example of where by using flash, using Flambient, you get higher paying gigs. So this was for a remodel company. And what happens is you go out, you charge by the hour, you really don't take that many photos, but you're there for a long time, so you get paid really well. You do an initial batch of photos and then they come back and they have you do a bunch of edits and those are paid by the hour. In fact, these edits for this particular job won't just be a one-time thing. They might come back three months, six months, one year, even two years. I've had clients come back later and say, you know what, we want to change things because styles have changed. How much would you charge to do this? And then they pay me to make those other edits. Let's go over to Photoshop and let me show you what I mean. So you can see this had a lot of layers taken, but it really was just your standard type of flambient blending really wasn't anything different than a lot of the uh, other stuff where I've got some flash composites that I'm putting together here like I've shown, and then I add some flambient layers. Now I am doing some other color corrections in here, but then I add the window pole, few other things, a few color corrections there here. This gets advanced and yes, that's covered in the course and also in my books. But once you then have something that you like, you send that to the customer. But if you notice here, the chairs are red. But in my finished image that I provided them, you can see that the chairs are a different color. Also notice, by the way, this wood around here. They had me change also the wood molding so that it wasn't a wood color. I can zoom in here a little bit more to show you some of that. So once again, I'm changing also that wood casing, the color around that wood. And the biggest one though is, well, changing these bar stool colors so that they match another color. So this is very common 
with builders and remodel companies, designers, the architectural type of work. And there are some days that I don't even leave the house because I'm busy all day editing for these various clients. So this is another opportunity though, where you can make more money if you know how to do this editing. For instance, changing some of these bar stool colors, you can see here, I've got different types of masking going on. I've got different type of adjustments going on so that I can change the color, trying to match also the brightness of the color, getting different tones and hues in there. And this stuff is not rocket science. It really isn't that difficult. It's just different. It's, if, you're not, if you don't know how to do this, it's just something that's new. But besides that, by using flash, you also have another advantage. And that's being able to put flash where you want it. So this was for a, another builder, but I would do this even for a listing, for a real estate listing. It's a shower pop. You may be familiar with these from other videos I've done where we've got an ambient shot, we've got a flash shot. Yeah, that can be blended to give you some flambit, but you're not gonna get a good view into the shower like this. And that's done by popping flash inside of the shower. Here I flashed it on one side and then I go to the other side and I flash it there so that I can edit both of those in there. And once they are, I've got this. This is a much more impactful photo. It's something you just can't get out of doing HDR or trying to do just all ambient because the ambient light isn't doing you any favors. So this is definitely a more complex method, but this gets you higher paying work. And I know there's the argument that, well, you live in the Midwest, you live someplace, the real estate isn't that expensive, no one's gonna pay for this. Yes, they will. You just haven't found the right client. Um, also, there's a mix of doing this. So once again, don't discount the idea of doing flambit, even if you wanna do HDR, because HDR can be viable for some circumstances, and I even use it for some stuff out here in California but it's not the HDR that you may be thinking of. So anyways, let's cover HDR next. So this is a high quality HDR image. Now, this might look like somewhat of a flashed shot, but let's start with what we had. This used no flash at all, so it was very fast on sight. All that I did is that I've got a bracket of three shots, so here, I'm doing typical exposure, just a little bit right of center, and then I go two stops darker, two stops brighter. And this may look like awful footage right here, but this is gonna help us get this finished image, but it's gonna take some work. So while I was shooting this, it took a few seconds. That was it, then I could move on to the next shot. That's what makes HDR so tempting. But it used to be that in the past, not now, but in the past, you would shoot these brackets and you would run it through software like even Lightroom's HDR, Photoshop's HDR, maybe Infuse, Photomatic, something like that. That's a thing of the past. And that's why a lot of photographers sending their outsourced work to editors overseas think they're doing some kind of magic. Well, the magic is actually really simple. I'm gonna show you that. All you would do is, after doing your pre-processing presets on this stuff, you open it as layers in Photoshop. And we can see that here. Now, what I did was I made two groups, so I can show you how this is done. One, this is the original image that I worked with here. Up here then has our footage, and that's gonna be the one that I'll demo here. With the demo footage, we've got then our dark layer, our medium layer, we've got then our brightness layer. So all three of those shots that were taken that were two stops apart. But if you take a look down here, what it took, you'll notice there were more adjustment layers. <laughs> And that was just to be able to correct the colors. Because for instance, after we do this HDR technique that I'm gonna show you, then I had to get rid of the cyans down here on the floor. If you notice, there was a lot of blue on the floor. I had to get rid of that. It was also here on the island. So I needed to get rid of that, but I needed to get rid of that selectively. So there's techniques you can do to do that. For instance, using a hue saturation layer, if we go here to the uh, cyans, and I was able to use the selective tool here and be able to do that. And by the way, yeah, this is covered in the course and I also have uh, other tutorials online about this as well. I'll have links to everything down in the description for this video. Anyways, the same thing was done here then when we get to the yellows because there was a lot of yellows that were on the cabinets. We can see a certain range of yellow hue was selected, some desaturation applied because without that, the cabinets and up here the paint had this awful color. Now I knew it was yellow, not from looking at it, but also by doing this 
automatic selection. Anyways, let's start from scratch. Let's just turn off this layer down here, this whole group, and we'll work with the footage that we took. Because this gets you then an idea what you're up against. Is it worthwhile to do this technique? Is it worthwhile to do flambient? So what you would do is we're gonna first turn off this dark layer. That's really for our windows. If you didn't get a view to the outside for the windows and you wanted one, and this wasn't dark enough, just take another exposure for it. So anyways, we turn that off and we're really interested in these two layers here. This is so that we can get a well-balanced image. You can see this has a lot of shadows, a lot of highlights. So what we wanna do is we want to turn first this layer off. There's a couple ways to do it. This is one approach. We're gonna turn that layer off and we're gonna go down to this real bright layer that doesn't seem to make any sense. Go over to channels and do control click on RGB, on that little window there, that little icon next to RGB. Go over to layers. Now turn this layer back on. What you wanna do is you wanna to go to the select menu you wanna to go to modify and you wanna to go to feather and you wanna feather this by something huge like 100 pixels. Then you click this little icon down here, this little mask icon, and you've got now some of those shadows brightened up. And you can see this was then without adding that layer. This is with our mask. This is if we didn't do that highlight selection that we did when we clicked the RGB channel. Now, something you can do here, you could uh, just start erasing some of this off the mask if it's too dark or add some. So what you can do though, you can add it into a group by going here, say group from layers. And now what you can do is add a layer mask by going to layer, mask, and then reveal all. And now you can erase. So you can say, you know what, we wanna brighten up this layer over here, this, this area over here. So now you can start erasing off of that. And I'm using a 30% flow on my brush so that I get just a little bit more control. Was that too much? Well, you can just use that uh, brush and brush that back in. So you get control then over how much you want. This was then without it, this is with our addition. So anyways, you can see this is now becoming a fairly well balanced photo. Still pretty bright down here though on the floor and there's really not much we can do about that. Really not much at all. Um, that where if we used flash, most of that would go away. But for this case, it's just a moderate home. This isn't for a builder. It's for a listing. It may get you by. It's looking pretty good. Let's do the windows. So this is where the difficult part comes in. So with the windows, you can see there's no way to just automatically get those in. When we were using darkened mode window poles using the flambient method, the views automatically came in, no big deal. But here it's different and it's a lot different. So first thing you wanna do is add a layer mask. You go up to your layer menu, you go down to layer mask and you would then say hide all. Now we can easily then go over here to these windows and just draw a polygon around these windows really quick like, like here, because there's nothing obstructing the view. So we can select these areas here, and then we'll just do a little modify and feathering just to add a little bit of natural ability to those. So we'll just go to select, and then we'll go to modify, and then we'll go to, let's say, expand that by about oh, a pixel. And then we'll go to select and then modify again, but this time we'll feather it by about a pixel, just one pixel. And then by pressing Alt Delete on the keyboard, that view comes in. Now we could refine those edges. It's not the, the, the perfect one there. You can see you do have to get in kind of close and be able to edit some of that out. So I got a little bit too much there. But the hard part really comes in when you're trying to do this technique is to go over here because we've got things that are partially obstructing the view. So this is where you have to do some other special luminosity masking, which is basically what we did here with this image by adding that. So if we go back here and on this particular layer and we go over to the channels icon and do a shift, or excuse me, a control click on it, then we start selecting those highlights. We can do control alt shift click to refine that a little bit more. That gets us in there. Now we can take a brush and with about a 30% flow, 
trying to stay in here too, we can brush in some of that. But you can see it's going to bleed out, even though we're protecting it with the luminosity mask, it's going to bleed out. Control D to deselect. So you can see that we got some on the cabinet, which means now nah, we should probably go over here, use a quick selection tool, grab the cabinet, press delete. We got maybe a little bit too much over here. Select that quick selection, delete. So you have to kind of fuss around with it to get that view to the outside. So that becomes difficult. Once again, I'll just go over here and refine these real quick. And I just did that with a polygon tool real quick so I wouldn't be wasting your time on this video. But you can see we've got something that's fairly decent. But now we've got these color issues that are going on here. And that's why in the original image, if we shut this off, we go down here and turn this one on, we can see that that looked better. So this is what we had done so far. This was the final image that I had worked with. Now there's a little bit of a difference in masking for the ambient. You can see that the colors though are looking much better with the finished image down here. And that's because of these hue saturation layers that I added. So this is tricky. This is where you have to start playing with colors to get this stuff right because you don't have flash to get you the correct colors. And once again, this worked well shooting toward the windows because I've got light working with me, but I don't have the ability to place light where I need to, for instance, like with a shower pop that I would if I were to be using flash. But this technique also works very well for something that I do for large properties. Let's take a look at something. Now, this is a very large room. So this was a bank, it was built in 1927. I had an earlier video on this, by the way, and you can see the whole technique for how this is done, linked down in the description for the video on how this was done. But basically, this is so big, I wouldn't be using lights. But bear in mind that when it comes to large interior architecture, the designers and the architects, they've built the space to be evenly lit for a reason. There's a lot more design that goes into lighting these, designing the lighting for this, than you would just a tract home or just a standard everyday home. Now, high-end luxury homes will also have lighting, but this gets a much more even amount of lighting to work with. Let's take a look at the footage, for instance. So this is just a medium exposure shot, and you can see I could have almost used this. Now, I wanted to fill in some shadows, so I had a really bright exposure that I took. I also wanted to be able to get rid of all that glare from the lights and from the windows, so I had this exposure. But just with these three exposures together, I was able to do that type of luminosity masking for doing this high-end HDR in Photoshop. And you can see I had the footage down here. So I had, um, this was the darker exposure here. You can see that was for the lights and for the windows. And then I had that medium exposure up above, then that real bright exposure to be able to fill in some of the shadows. Without it, it would have been darker. So this helped fill in the shadows. This got rid of the highlights. And then above it, it was just a matter of adding a bunch of different adjustments to it. I did a special uh, pseudo white balance adjustments and that's what this original layer was down here for. That was doing the uh, average blur technique if you've seen my videos on that or in my courses and books. And then of course, just some other hue saturation layers, some color balance, just to even things out. But this is where then the high-end HDR does work. So editing real estate photos isn't difficult. It's just that some of these things may be new to you. It's something though that you shouldn't shy away from and it's something you should learn to perfect. Not only will pro editing make you a better photographer, it can make you more money by making you a well-rounded, diversified media solutions provider.